Uh, before I jump into that, I just want to um, kind of go back to what we were talking about, um, what Tony was talking about right before the break about um, submitting talks and, and talking at conferences. Um, I think a lot of people get really nervous about the idea of talking in front of people. And you know, a lot of people that I talk to that say, oh, I really want to present something, but I don't have anything good enough to present. I don't have anything worthy to present. And I think that's kind of a, a fallacy. Um, you know, you don't have to be Rich Troughton to present at a conference. You know, you don't have to have like amazing, in-depth, super serious, technical, high-level stuff. Um, I talk to quite a few people who go to conferences very early in their career, and one of the things they say is, you know, the networking was great and the sessions were awesome, but so many of the sessions went right over my head. And so, if you have, if you think you could talk about something that's a little more beginner or intermediate, don't be afraid to to pitch that talk to a conference because I'm sure there are people in the audience who are going to see that talk and go, oh, wow, I didn't know that. That's awesome. So you know, like I said, you don't have to be rich. I mean, after all, they let me do this stuff. So how hard can it be, right? That was supposed to be funny. Sorry. <laughs> Most people are. You're laughing at me, not with me, right? Is that how that goes? So I'm John Kitzmiller. Um, that's me, guy with the beard. I had a mishap a couple, uh, like about a week and a half ago with the, with the trimming, and so um, unfortunately, this is all I have right now, and I feel very naked. Um, but this isn't a talk about my beard or the lack thereof. Um, so I I call myself a former Apple deployment consultant, which is kind of what I am, I and mean, I still do a little bit of consulting. Um, but I've worked in the past for for Apple. Uh, I've worked for Jamf Software and professional services. And I've worked for the Lindy Group, uh, the makers of Auto Packager, uh, based in the Bay Area. Um, and I've actually, to date, to the best of my knowledge and estimates, I've actually helped deploy over 1 million Apple devices in 27 countries. Um, so yeah, that's me. Um, I actually also have a blog at johnkitzmiller.com. Um, you can check it out if you want. You don't have to. I'm not going to make you. Um, but now, I don't really do consulting as my full-time job now. I work for a company called Fastly. Um, Fastly is a content delivery network based in San Francisco. However, we do have points of presence all over the world, including one right here in Sydney. Um, so we basically make the internet go faster, is what they tell me. I don't really understand how it all works and what we do, because I'm so far removed from that side of, of our business. But um, we're also always hiring. Um, any smart people, any engineers, any developers, any uh, people who want to make the internet go faster, uh, fastly.com slash careers. We hire both in San Francisco and also remote. So just throwing that out there because they told me I had to. So I want to introduce you guys to a good friend of mine. This is Luna. Luna is one of the dogs that works at Fastly. And she was tasked recently with building a JSS. <laughs> and Luna knew that I knew a thing or two about that and asked me to help out. So I, I, who could say no to that face? <laughs> so the thing is, is that she wanted the JSS to be both secure, but also highly available and globally accessible. So we, she wanted to make sure that all the machines could be managed wherever they were in the world, as long as they had an internet connection. But you know, things had to be secure and things had to be highly available. So that was the challenge. She had a few requirements as well for the high availability. So the biggest one, and this is true across most of the infrastructure at Fastly, is single points of failure are like the worst sin you can commit. Um, we're very much against them. Um, again, available to all devices globally. Anything with an internet connection should be able to check in um, and you know, be managed. And we also wanted automated failover and recovery. So if any particular piece of the JSS fails, there should be no human interaction needed for the JSS to continue running. Um, and as, as much as possible, it should be able to recover from these failures automatically as well. So you know, no pressure. And the InfoSec team, of course, had their own list of requirements. Um, the first one was no access to the admin interface 
without going through a VPN. Um, the reason for the VPN is at Fastly, we don't believe in anything such as a privileged or safe network. Our office is essentially a coffee shop when it comes to our network. We have a connection out to the internet, and that's it. So everything else has to be done in some other secure way. So uh, we don't have a direct VPN from our office into AWS. Um, there's another VPN that's really outside of the scope of this talk. But uh, the takeaway here is if you just are some guy or girl or dog out in the internet somewhere, you shouldn't be able to get to the admin interface of the JSS. And just to make things more fun, um, even though we want every device in the world to be able to talk to the JSS, the servers cannot have any direct contact with the public internet. So that was the challenge. And that brings us to building a highly available and secure, which is missing from this slide, JSS in Amazon Web Services. So I think before we get too far into this, it's important to talk about what a traditional JSS in an on-prem situation would look like and what a lot of you probably have today. So you've got your public internet and you've got your internal network. And in the internal network, you have a JSS web server. Um, this serves as both the admin interface and the client interface. So your admins log into this and your clients talk to it. Um, it's talking to a database that could be on the same box. It could be a separate box. Not really important for what we're talking about here. You have clients on your internal network, iOS 10, uh, OS 10 iOS, maybe both. Uh, and these communicate directly with your JSS. And that's all well and good until a device leaves your network. So once your devices leave your network and get on the public internet, you still want to be able to manage them. But you don't necessarily want to open up your internal JSS to the outside world, because that could potentially provide direct access into the database um, or give you know, admin interface access to someone um, that could brute force the password and get in and cause all kinds of havoc. So what a lot of organizations do is they set up a DMZ, or hopefully they already have a DMZ, and they put a second web app in the DMZ. And any of you who have built one like this know that there's a way in the JSS to tell it that this DMZ web app should not have an admin interface. So when you actually go to the JSS in a web browser, when you're on the outside and you get routed into the DMZ, you actually just see a, you know, your interface has been disabled. It's just a, a white page with some text. And there's no, no way to log into that and actually um, you know, perform functions. However, it's important to know that you can still perform API actions against that. So keep that in mind. And of course, your devices then from the public internet can talk to the uh, admin disabled JSS in the DMZ, which then talks to the database internal and the two JSS web apps keep in sync. Did I cover all that? Okay. So in our AWS, AWS model, all the traffic comes from the public internet. So this internal external or you know internal DMZ doesn't really hold up um, because you know we ha we even though we're hiding our um, admin interface behind a VPN, it's still considered you know, traffic still considered coming from the public internet. So what we end up doing is um, we take our two web apps and we point them at a, a database. Um, we use RDS, although you could build your own MySQL cluster if you wanted to, but I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So these are actually going to end up being um, two sets of clusters, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, so the one cluster is going to be used to administer the JSS. That'll be, we'll call it the JSS admin server or cluster. And that's going to only be accessible from a VPN. The other one we're going to call JSS client. This is the one where the interface is disabled and all the clients talk to it, and that's going to be available from the public internet. So how do we actually make this work? What we end up doing is dividing our, inner, or our, our network in AWS, or our VPC, into two separate subnets. We have a private and a public. And the idea here is that the private is where all the actual um, you know, work takes place. So the JSS servers live in there, and the public is think of it more like your DMZ. And because we want high availability, we also split these 
across availability zones. So we've got um, you know, two availability zones in the same region. That way, even in the event that Amazon loses an entire availability zone, you know, we still have that other availability zone to work in and our JSS doesn't go down. So where are we at here? So what we're going to do is we're actually going to put two JSS servers in each availability zone. And they're going to be uh, paired up in that in AZ1, we'll have a client and an admin interface. And in AZ2, we'll have a client and an admin interface. So that's for redundancy. So if one admin goes down, we can fail over to the other in the other availability zone. So did I lose my? OK. So we're going to use elastic load balancers as the way to communicate through the public uh, facing network into the private network. That way, these servers aren't directly exposed. So it's just kind of like a proxy. Now, the interesting thing about elastic load balancers is that they are a single thing in AWS, but they actually are kind of a, a group of servers because a um, elastic load balancer has to exist in two availability zones for redundancy. So again, if one zone goes down, you fail over to the other. So that's why it's kind of in the middle of the line there. And so what we're doing is we're setting up two of these elastic load balancers. One is for the client communication, and one is for the admin communication. And then we limit, uh, using Amazon security groups, limit the traffic to the admin side for specific IPs coming from our VPN. And so that worked great. We could VPN in. We could administer the JSS. We could get clients to check in wherever they were in the world. It, it really couldn't fail unless AWS lost an entire region, at which case we had bigger problems to worry about. Now, I don't have time today to go into the technical side of how to set up this elastic load balancer, but there are a few tricks to it. But I do have a blog post um, on my site basically detailing this in, in great technical detail. So if you're interested in, in how to set up the uh, load balancer, that's a great place to go. And bear with me one second here. Had the wrong view. OK. So that was working great. And Luna was super happy. I was super happy. Everything was great. And then InfoSec had a meeting that Luna wasn't invited to. And what happened is they evaluated AWS for a lot of different security things, not just because of Casper, but a lot of infrastructure was ending up in AWS. And so InfoSec wanted to get a better picture of what was actually happening with all these you know, black boxes of elastic load balancers and RDS services and things we couldn't really see into. So what they found is actually a little interesting. Um, Amazon makes no guarantee of the security of traffic passing through things like elastic load balancers. So that may not sound too bad, but when you consider things like you know, FileVault, we're, we're encrypting disks and we're taking that encryption key and passing that up through the load balancer into the JSS. So since the SSL is terminating on the load balancer, in theory, anyone with access to that load balancer could start yanking these FileVault keys out of, uh, out of the traffic. Um, not a great thing. The other thing they weren't crazy about is we'd have to upload our SSL certificates directly to the uh, Elastic Load Balancer. So then again, we're, we're just basically taking our SSL certs and handing them right to Amazon saying, here you go. Now, I'm sure Amazon doesn't have any interest in our SSL certs, but you never know. So uh, security came back with a new list of security requirements. So we still couldn't access the JSS admin interface without VPN. We still couldn't access the servers directly from the outside world. And now we can't terminate SSL on servers we don't control. And Luna's reaction, something like that. <laughs> so Luna and I sat down and we talked and talked and talked. How are we going to solve this problem? Because you know, sure, we could terminate SSL directly on Tomcat, but then we lose the ability to see what IP address um, machines are, co are, are coming from. Because when the traffic is encrypted and it passes through a, you know, a proxy or an elastic load balancer or something like that, if the traffic doesn't get de-encrypted there, the request to the JSS looks like it's just coming from the load balancer. So I don't know if any of you have worked in, on a JSS environment where you have a, a JSS behind a load balancer 
But one of the biggest problems that you'll see off the bat if things aren't configured correctly is that every computer now has the IP address of your load balancer. And that's, that's not good. We don't want that. So we, we had to terminate SSL at the edge, and it had to be somewhere we controlled, and we couldn't put our JSS servers at the edge. So what did we do? Well, luckily, we found an answer. And that answer is HAProxy. So HAProxy is essentially an open source, high performance TCP HTTP load balancer. You can find out more about it at haproxy.org. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we configured this to still have the high availability and the failover and redundancy that we needed that, and that we got with the elastic load balancers. So going back to how we have our, our availability zones set up, and we have the admin and client interfaces happening at the same time uh, in different AZs. So this time, instead of elastic load balancers, we're going to use a pair of HA proxy servers. We're going to put one in each availability zone. And rather than running in parallel, like the elastic load balancers were, these are actually going to be run in a master and backup configuration. So in the default state, the first HA proxy server is listening for all the traffic for both admin and client. And when the requests come in, it directs it to the appropriate server. If something happens to that availability zone or to that HA proxy server, the second one will take over. And it will then send all the traffic through to the appropriate node. Now, the reason we did it this way, instead of doing a round robin DNS and pointing to each HA proxy server, is another little quirk with Casper, is that um, the JSS web apps don't necessarily talk to each other as often as you would like. Um, and where that becomes most apparent is if a machine is enrolling, um, it has to send several requests, and they have to go to the same web server. Otherwise, the enrollment fails, because you know, it, it goes to server A and says, hey, I'm here. I have a, mach a machine. I need some stuff. The JSS will come back and say, great, here's your stuff. The machine comes back. If it hits the second web app, the second web app goes, I don't know you. I've never heard of you before. Get out of here. So you have to actually have persistence, um, is what most load balancers call it. Um, and I couldn't find a way to make HA proxy, the two servers talk to each other to share persistence information. So round robin DNS wasn't going to work. Um, so that's why we went with this route. So each HA proxy, well, we'll get into that later. Each HA proxy uh, handles persistence, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. So there's a lot going on there. A lot of pieces are happening to make that work uh, you know, kind of the way it does. So first, I want to talk about SSL termination. Uh, so we're terminating the SSL on HA proxy. And so what it does is it listens for our HTTPS traffic. It then terminates SSL, decrypts the traffic, and sends the traffic via HTTP over to the appropriate JSS web app. Um, and using, using this SSL termination and a, a type of header called X forwarded for, that ensures that the JSS will then not see the IP address of the HA proxy server, but the actual IP of the client where the request is coming from. So we've solved that problem. Next, I want to talk about load balancing. So Essentially, for each you know, side of the JSS, the admin, the client side, we have a cluster of two servers. And this could be a cluster of three servers, six servers, a dozen servers. It doesn't matter. Um, it all, it all kind of works the same once you get more than one. Um, so what's happening here is the HA proxy servers are running a constant health check to all the nodes that they're talking to. And that's so they know if the node's healthy. They know if the node's there. Um, it's basically how they know, do, can I send traffic to you or not? If you're not responding, I'm not going to send you traffic. So this does use round robin to a point. So my first machine goes to check in, and HA proxy says, great, I'm going to send you to the first JSS web server because it's responding and everything's good. Now our second machine comes in and says, well, I just sent the last machine to the first JSS. I'm going to send you to the second one. Our third machine comes in and goes, well, we're going to go back to number one because it's his turn. Now, if our first machine comes back, even though it's technically the second server's turn, because of that persistence, which is achieved through a cookie, 
it knows it has to go back to the first web app because it's the same web app it was talking to before. So that solves our problem of enrollments failing and, and you know, communication not happening properly. So if one of the JSS cluster nodes disappears in a great big ball of fire, the JSS or the HA proxy server is going to detect that with a check. And even though our second computer was going to the second server, it's now going to get redirected back to the first. So that could potentially cause a failure in communication or a failure to run a policy if a policy was running at that time against that server that failed. However, JSS is smart enough that it should just pick it up and do it again the next time and everything will be cool. So not too worried about it there. That's a pretty tolerable failure in my opinion. Now, the last thing we have is the automated failover. And this is, in my opinion, the coolest, but was also the hardest to implement. So we have these two EHA proxy servers. And one's running as a master, one's running as a backup. And for a little while, the only way we could fail over was if one uh, fell down, we'd have to take the elastic IP address we gave it and reroute it to the other one. And then that one would take over. So there's no DNS changes. There's no, um, you know, nothing like that. We're just basically taking the IP address that is our JSS, our entire JSS cluster, and moving it to the other server. So these are in separate availability zones again for redundancy. And what's happening here is they are keeping in constant communication with each other using a process called Keep Alive D. Uh, so what Keep Alive D does essentially is it lives on both servers, and one's configured as master, one's configured as backup, and they're both constantly communicating with each other. And basically, Keep Alive D is configured to say, you know, one server says the other, "Hey, does HA Proxy have a PID? It does. Cool. It's good. If it gets no response from the server, or if the server responds says, oh, there's no PID for HA Proxy, then the server considers the other one to have failed. So if the Backup fails, well, the master just keeps on chugging along. Um, sorry, forgot to put the master backup up there. So if the backup fails, the master's going to keep chugging along. Everything's fine. Um, oh, yeah, and our elastic IP. I'm kind of behind here, aren't I? OK, I think we're caught up. Yes, so uh, constantly checking. Now, if the master doesn't respond to the backup, it goes into a fail state. And the other server goes into master state. And it, what it does is it yanks the elastic IP over to itself using a script written with the AWS command line tools. Now, should the master server come back up, say we reboot it um, and everything's working again, then it'll resume the role of the master and take that elastic IP back. So now I want to talk about how we're handling one uh, HA proxy server handling traffic for two different DNS names, and one of them has to be restricted um, to a certain IP address or range of IPs. Luckily, the folks who designed HA proxy were really smart and thought of this. So there's a way to configure on a per DNS entry um, you know, where the traffic's actually allowed to come from. Because before we were using Amazon security groups. And we couldn't do that here because it's all one server. And we can't, uh, you know, we can't give a security group that says, well, if it's this DNS name. And, you know, so we had to do that in HA proxy. So um, if we try to do the JSS admin and we're from the VPN, HA proxy is going to say, great, you can go right ahead and go through to the admin interface. Similarly, if we're on the public internet and we send in a request to the client, uh, JSS, HA proxy says, great, you can go on right ahead through. Uh, and if we're behind the VPN and we send a request for the JSS client interface, it's going to send us right through again, because again, we're allowing access to the client interface from literally any IP. But what happens if we try to access the JSS admin from the public internet? Well, HA proxy's got a lovely. Um, configuration where we can actually just throw up a 403. So you can still hit that DNS name, and it'll still route to the HA proxy server, but you're not going to get any further past it unless you're behind the VPN. 
much like Luna, trying to get into the security meeting. I thought that was going to be funnier. Sorry. <laughs> it's always fun doing these talks for the first time, the things you think are going to be jokes, and, and yeah, it's great. So, um, unfortunately, I don't have the time today. Actually, I guess I kind of do. But um, I, I don't have the time to go into all the technical details of how this is configured, because it's, it's very complex, and it's very um, you know, intricate, and this is a very high-level overview. Uh, but what I am going to do is get a blog post going that details how all this is set up, all the little intricacies and specifics. So I'll be posting that on my website, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. I'm still, it's, like I said, it's, it's a lot to go through, so it's, it's still kind of in development. Um, if you want to get notified when that posts, if you go to my website, there's an email list you can sign up for. I, I don't spam you. I only email when I post things. Um, and it's like once every other week or something. So, uh, Or just watch the website. Or follow me on Twitter, whatever you want to do. Um, so let's take a look at our requirements. Let's make sure we met them all. So we don't have a single point of failure, unless you want to consider AWS a single point of failure, in which case, you know, how, how far can you really go? We're available to all devices globally. And we've got automated failover and recovery of critical components. And we're also meeting the security requirements, because we can't access the admin interface without the VPN. We have no direct access to the JSS servers from the outside world, because HAProxy is handling that for us. And we're terminating SSL on servers that we control and monitor. So security's happy. So I, tip, I purposely kept this a little short, because I usually get a lot of questions about this. Um, before we go into questions, I just want to say thanks to, to Tony and everyone at AUC and UTS for putting this on. This is awesome. I'm super happy to be here. Uh, I want to thank Rich Troughton for just being a great guy and incredible wealth of knowledge. Um, and yeah, there's how you can find me on Twitter and or Slack, uh, macadmins.org for Slack, if, uh, if you don't um, know about that yet. And I'd love to take any questions you have about this setup. Do we have anyone to, uh, to run the mic? Or am I just going to do it myself? I'll start with Rich. I'm nice and close. Yeah, you're nice and close. So with regards to your InfoSec team's uh, uncertainty and uncomfortableness with using an AWS Elastic Load Balancer, was the main issue just that Amazon wasn't guaranteeing it, or did they discover actual vulnerabilities uh, with using the Elastic Load Balancer? Um, how much of this can I answer? Um, They did a pen test, uh, and after the pen test, it was decided we weren't using ELBs. Um, but they also did talk to Amazon, and the fact that there was no uh, guarantee of the security of the data was, was right there enough to kill it anyway. Uh, in addition, from the beginning, they really hated the idea of taking our SSL certs and just giving them to Amazon. So it was, it was kind of a combination of, of a few different things. Um, but there was an actual technical evaluation and pen test. What's the role of the kangaroo? What kangaroo? In the picture. That's a dog. <laughs> oh, hey. I, I don't know. I haven't met that kangaroo yet. I didn't realize we had one. <laughs> that's InfoSec. Yeah, that's, that's the InfoSec team, I'm sure. OK, so either I explained this so well that no one has any questions, or I did such a poor job that no one even knows where to start. Yeah, you got one over here? OK. Does this work? Yeah. Uh, with your HA proxy, with your source incoming and coming from the VPN, are you doing that by a specific IP, IP range, or? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but both? Uh, so yeah, essentially, there, there's an IP address that is the VPN server. Um, okay. And that's what's allowing the, the traffic to come through. Cool. Um, something actually, uh, you reminded me of something I, I forgot to put in here, and that is that uh, in addition to not allowing access to the servers um, to the public internet, we couldn't have SSH access to the servers as well. So the way we got around that was kind of the similar thing to HA proxies. We put a another EC2 instance in the public section of the um, the, the VPC. And we use that as what we call a jump host. And we SSH into that first. 
and then that's allowed to SSH into the other servers. Um, and that first one is actually protected by um, duo uh, two-factor authentication. So we have to two-factor into SSH, and then we can SSH into the actual you know, real servers. How do you protect a SSH server via two-factor? <laughs> so there's a company called Duo Security. Um, if you haven't checked them out, it's, it's really cool stuff. Um, they essentially, you get an app that you install on your phone. And f the way it works for a lot of things is a push request will be sent. Um, so like we use Okta as our primary um, authentication provider. And Okta kind of hooks up with, with Duo in that if I try to log into Okta, it sends a push through Duo to my phone that I have to then approve and give my thumbprint or my passcode uh, before I'm led into Okta. And a similar thing happens with um, SSH access. So, so Duo was actually built by um, you know, engineers, go figure, and they wanted a way to two-factor their servers. So what they do is they, the server actually, when you go to SSH in, it sends a two-factor request through Duo that then I have to approve on my phone, thumbprint or passcode, um, and that's how we protect those behind Two factors. So I, I believe it's, it's either duo.com or duosecurity.com or both. Uh, but that's a great service I'd recommend checking out if you're interested in doing that. Rich has another question. Or is it a heckle? Uh, it's actually neither. Um, oh, uh oh. So to follow up on the question of establishing two factor authentication for uh, SSH, uh, Papine Brienne actually has a post on uh, his blog, enterprisemac.brienne.com, uh, that talks about how to enable Google two-factor authentication for your own uh, SSH servers. Oh, interesting. So that, that's something that you could set up yourself for free, and I'll post the link for that to the Twitter feed. Thank you. That's awesome. And that's Papine, who now works for Duo. Yes. <laughs> um, you said you were using cookies for persistence with a load balancer. Is yes. that right? Because that's, that's how ours, we've, we've got internally hosted JSS clustered and we were having issues after that was built with uh, enroll a machine, hits JSS1, and then oh, enrollment complete, I'll check in for enrollment complete policies, our oh, different JSS. And it turned out it was because we were using cookies for, for that rather than um, IP address, source IP address of the clients. So once we switched to that, um, we've said this, you know, I think, it's, I think we've got it set to four hours where this client with this IP address will always hit this JSS. Um, that sort of solved those problems. What's, uh, what load balancing solution are you using? Uh, F5s. I'm sorry, what was that? F5. Oh, F5. DMs, yeah. yeah, so I've actually done a few builds with F5, and I found that for, for whatever reason in their particular load balancers, the IP uh, sourcing actually works a lot better. Mm. Um, we couldn't do that in our situation because so many of our users are in our office, and so according to the load balancer, they all have the same IP address because they're coming from one WAN connection. So that would effectively take our load balancing and just cut it off completely. Uh, now, obviously, on an internal network, that would make a lot more sense because you know the, the, the um, individual IPs would would make their way through. So uh, we had to end up going with cookies uh, for whatever reason with HA proxy. It works, and it doesn't work on F5. I'm not really sure why. Um, yeah, so far it's been working great for us. Cool, thanks. Y'all can ask questions about other stuff too if you want. I mean, I can answer anything you want. Really You've beaten them into submission, man. <laughs> I know, they're saving all the really tough questions for dinner. Yes. <laughs> so just out of curiosity, is it that I just covered it so well or are, is, are people really confused about what just happened here? <laughs> okay, cool. I'm never sure. What's that? I look forward to the blog post. I look forward to the blog post too, because that means I'm done writing it. And it's been, th this has been something I've been working on for, it was 2015 when I started. Let's just put it that way. And uh, this rolled into production this week. So it's, it's been a very long and arduous process. And I'm very happy to write that blog post and be done with it and move on to something else. Okay, well, please thank John for that. It was, I assume, great, but I had to duck out. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs>